Welcome to a Deep Adaptation Q&A with me, Jen Bendel. These are independently organised dialogues about uh, various aspects of the, the theme of, of Deep Adaptation, which we're going to hear quite a bit more of today. Um, our guest, uh, where we, who we're going to explore this topic with today, is Kat Suarez. Uh, Kat Suarez is the core, uh, core team coordinator of the Deep Adaptation Forum, which is also something we're going to hear about today. And Kat uh, has been involved in the various networks that make up the forum, uh, initially as a volunteer since early 2019. Uh, and then uh, over time then did a number of roles and then became the coordinator. I myself left the uh, Deep Adaptation Forum uh, in about, I think, October 2020. So I'm actually quite uh, interested in, in hearing how things have evolved as well since then. Uh, Kat came at this job uh, with a background in sustainability. And um, that's also interesting to me because that's how I came to the, the perspective. That was my background too. So I think we're going to talk quite a bit about that, how, how it might be a help or a hindrance as we try and uh, meet the predicament uh, and find positive ways forward. Kat, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you, Jim, and thank you everybody for showing up. It's lovely to see so many faces on the screen. Yes, and um, I'm looking forward to hearing questions from you all. Uh, well, maybe in about half an hour, I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, hog the mic for about half an hour and ask Kat some questions. But Kat, first up, for those people who don't know what the Deep Adaptation Forum is, in your own words, because I know, you know, I know, I know what we said it was when we started it, but, but what, in your own words for now, what is the da Deep Adaptation Forum about? Why does it do what it, do, it does? How does it feel in the Deep Adaptation Forum as well? Give us a sense of that. Thanks, Jim. I'm glad you said in your own words, because as everyone can imagine, it's a question that's asked often. And my response historically is if you were to ask any one of the 12, 14, 15,000 members, they would all give you their own reality of what the Deep Adaptation Forum is. And that's part of what makes it magical, I suspect, and appealing to people. So from my perspective, it's a predominantly online global community of people who share a perspective that the predicaments we're facing into, climate change principle amongst those, uh, is already or will ultimately lead to interruptions in uh, our normal ways of living. So uh, some may say societal collapse, some societal interruption. Uh, but yes, yeah, so we're essentially a group of people who share a perspective about the realities of where we find ourselves now as a global population. And um, in terms of what do we do? Well, we've tried in the last 18 months to be um, we don't prescribe anything, if that makes sense. So as a core team, we try not to make prescriptions about welcome, here's step one, here's step two, here are the things you should know. So it's quite organic and it's evolving and shifting and changing all of the time. So as a core team, what we try to do is to facilitate and enable relationship uh, and relationships. So we have some core offerings and some things that we take responsibility for uh, around communications internally and increasingly some outward facing communications. Uh, we coordinate various activities, uh, including online events. Some of those are related to dialogue and discussion, some related to meditation and inner workings, some somatic practices. So there's a, a real diversity of offerings. And then there's also groups that come together to form uh, work teams or crews, or whatever language you like to use, who are very focused on very particular outcomes. So looking at policies to take into business around how do companies adapt, around education, how does education respond. So um, yeah, it's difficult to pin down and really difficult to define eloquently, but it's a space where anybody who holds this consciousness and awareness has the ability to pursue their own aspirations in relation to deep adaptation, be that very personal, very local, 
very global or very uh, attached to a theme or a particular endeavor. And it's it's wonderful hearing you describe it that way because also it helps me remember the early days when I thought, well, well, how could it be any different than that? Because the disruptions, breakdown, collapse even, will affect everything uh, in very different ways. And the responses will be very personal to people, depending on where, where, where they're at in their lives, responsibilities right now, and, and what their priorities will be. So it's really good to hear that. I'd like to just hear some before ask you a little bit more about how you got to this point. Something about the ethos then of the forum, because I think it's still quite a dominant thing when people think about, oh, a bad future, like a, a societal breakdown. They think then, well, that will mean prepping in the Mad Max way, or it will mean dictators, or it will mean sort of religious fundamentalism or um, hedonism. Um, it's almost like there are these tropes or stories in our culture already, um, which aren't the deep adaptation story. Aren't the ethos of actually responding in, in, in a very different way to those I've just described. So how does it, what is the ethos and how does it feel being in the deep adaptation forum? Well, I want to start by acknowledging all of the responses that you just mentioned, Jen, because to some mm -hmm. extent, the culture in which we're predominantly white and Western, Northern uh, Hemisphere membership, and the cultures in which we are raised indoctrinate us to respond in those ways. We're very self set, we're, we're trained to be very selfish, self motivated, self preser preserving. Deep adaptation differs from all of those other responses in that it it's Number one, we don't advocate any particular things to do. So we don't say here are the right things to do. It's a very open space. Fundamentally still underpinned by the original ambition which holds as true today as it did when you and your then core team conceived of this. So this is about enabling uh, uh, loving responses to our predicament. So it's, it's decentering the self in this. It's about relationship. And, that, and people interpret relationship in multiple ways. For me, there are three elements. So there's the relationship I have to myself. There's the relationship I have with my peers, my fellow humans, and a relationship to nature. And that underpins everything within the Deep Adaptation Forums. It really is um, ethos is around compassion, curiosity, and respect. Remaining, trying to remain open when everything around you is encouraging you to close down, to 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 clam up, to armor, to, to, to become tight and rigid, that compassion, curiosity, and respect are, are opening and uh, enabling loving responses to, uh, to our collapse is all about that. It's about remaining open, finding mm. comfort with the discomfort and, and centering ourselves in, in our relationships, not in our self. So is that, um, nourishing and enlivening, or do you find it overwhelming and heavy because this is such a big and tough topic? You know, I find the topic heavy and overwhelming, Jem, as I suspect do many of the people who are here today with us and who uh, watch this video later. I can hand on my heart say that I have never felt heavy or oppressed or overwhelmed within the community or when participating within deep adaptation in quite, in fact, quite the opposite. There's this mm. sense of opening and of spaciousness. And I feel like my capacity is massively enhanced through engagement with this incredible community of people. And that's not to say there aren't challenges. Of course there are, we're people. So we rub up against one another, but somehow the ethos on which we're founded means that we have new ways of dealing with tension and with conflict and with, there's this wonderful whew, lightness. It's a relief so to be part of this community. So 
my understanding is you I want, I want to go back a bit in a moment but my understanding is um, you have quite a lot of experience in facilitation of processes and of communities and organizations is this different in some way this uh, your experience within the deep adaptation forum or is it drawing upon things that you know about and that you believe in um, you no, know, it's what, very, not... sorry, Jim, it's very different. So I've experienced flavors of this in little pieces of work that I've done over the last 30 years. Um, and it's difficult to, to describe it, um, like a momentary flash or an insight or a, a, an epiphany of a fashion. Deep adaptation, my experience since being in the deep adaptation forum is that all of those insights co have coalesced and so um, it's really quite different it's really quite different so some of the structure some of the format some of the process work that I've done is helpful in this context quite a lot of it is not helpful at all because we're meeting in a different ideological space I suppose or a different level of a different piece of consciousness I'm not sure what the point of difference is but it's very different within the forum to anything I've experienced anywhere else I'd like I'd like to explore that a bit more but then to put put it in context about what you've experienced before could you tell us how where would <coughs> could you pinpoint something that was important in your journey towards the work you do now because I know in terms of you, you, you've worked in environmental sustainability for some decades before. Um, could you tell us a little bit about that? So what, what did you do in the past in, on sustainability and why do you still do some of it today? Um, just so we get that context and then we can see how the deep adaptation work fits with that. I can give you not. a little potted history and try not to take too much time. So as a young woman, a long time ago, um, I was very idealistic. Uh, I was gifted with some intelligence and some academic uh, skill. So I studied applied sciences and then environmental sciences and ecology and then sustainability. And I started my career working in government as a researcher. So I was out in nature, pre predominantly rivers and wetlands. But as everybody here understands, rivers and wetlands are merely an expression of the entire landscape. So it's, it, I covered quite broad area. And I suppose at the age of 21, 22, I imagined that being the best scientist in the world was all it would take to interrupt this trajectory that we were on. And after a few uh, years realizing, actually the best science in the world wasn't changing anything, maybe it was about policy and legislation. So I migrated sideways and I worked around drafting new legislative frameworks in the West Australian government. Uh, and then when I realized legislation was rubbish, I thought, well, maybe it's all about enforcement. Maybe what we really need is to just have bigger teeth. Maybe we can stop people from messing stuff up. And of course I dallied in licensing and regulation for a while and realized that didn't work and returned to my first love, which was science and investigations. At which time all the budgets for such things had been decimated. They'd been reduced to you know, by orders of magnitude. So that necessitated starting to work with communities and practicing community science. And for me, that was a massive revelation because I began to understand that what really makes a difference is supporting people in accessing information which has meaning and value for them in the context in which they operate. So it's very easy to stand on the outside as an environmentalist pointing fingers and saying, you're doing the wrong thing and you shouldn't be farming that way and here are the things you should be doing and here's the license and here's the protocols and the but none of that matters a dot because it, it's you need to be connecting with people where they are and responding to their to their needs so that was the first big shift and at that point in my career I transitioned into more of a facilitative role mm -hmm. Uh, supporting dialogue. When I left the government and went to work in private enterprise, I worked as a sustainability consultant and we worked on incredible initiatives. We built a potato reactor to deal with waste from, um, from a dioxide metal plant that had been killing water, killing fish and turning the bass strait red. We built the first entirely passive wastewater treatment system in the Southern hemisphere. We, we built, we did incredible projects. They were exciting. They were leading cutting edge. 
But in that context, I was missing that contact with people. And so again, a return back to more of a focus on facilitating and enabling conversation. And when I moved back to the UK from Australia 14 years ago, I made the decision that I would only do that type of work, that I would leave the sustainability stuff behind. It wasn't satisfying for me. And I would only do facilitation and working with communities around realizing their own ambitions for resilience and, and, and strength and sustainability. Uh, and I also made a decision that I'd only work just enough to pay my way in the world and the rest of my time I would give away for free. And that's what I still try to do because there are lots of people who benefit from the kind of language and fluency that I have around those matters that can't afford to pay for it. So mm -hmm. that's, um, that's neither here nor there, but my commitment went from being to, to the science proper to people mm -hmm. and the planet. And then at some point you discovered, um, ah, actually, I don't know this, Kat. I'll tell you. Where, 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 yeah, when, when did you discover the work I did and were you already on the same page? So I was already on the same page and lots of people who are watching this video uh, and listening in will know this already, but at about the age of 14, my mum asked me, what did I want to be when I grew up? And I said, sustainable, self-sufficient. And she said, I don't know what you mean by that. And I said, I want an acre of land with a little wooden house where I can meet all my requirements for life. Mm -hmm. And she said, I still am not understanding where does that come from? And I said, well, I know that when the shit hits the fan, I want to be in a position to close the gate and let it unravel and not be caught up in all of that. And my mum sent me away for therapy because she was very alarmed. This was 1984. So I'd somehow have absorbed the potential for that in my youth, got distracted as we all do, because our world is full of delightful distractions. Uh, so your paper came to my attention, I think it was the end of August in the year that you wrote it, which was what, 2018. And, and I suspect mm -hmm. it came to my attention because I was still moving very much within the sustainability field. So a lot of professional and personal contacts. I read your paper. I picked it up to read thinking it was just another one of those papers that it would take me a month to get through. I was gripped and read it start to finish. And I wrote to you and I will have been one of those millions of emails that you had in those early days saying, thank God someone said it out loud. How do I get involved? Right. And um, did someone reply? <laughs> <laughs> No, but I found the forum <laughs> very early in 2019. No, and no one replied. I have to go. I have to I have to complain. Get to your PA. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, so I joined the Ning platform, not being much of a social media user. And Dorian, bless him, uh, in his welcome email said, "Would you like to volunteer?" And not knowing any better, I said, "Yes, of course I would." Okay. And so he began a dance, which is still <laughs> underway. I see. Thank you for that story. I'm going to search my emails to try and find that historic first email from you, unless it's been archived. Um, well, actually, I can still find it, couldn't I? Everything's <laughs> kept forever these days, isn't it? If not by me, by someone else. Um, so I'm wondering then, it, so it sounds like, you were fine with this because of your own journey. So was there, were there any, was your background in sustainability and you, you've done, your background kind of includes the various elements of sustainability, you know, the science, the natural science, the conservation, uh, the policy and regulation, the innovation, the technology, the excitement there, then also the focus on people and communities and, also participation, facilitation, ways of organizing, community resilience. So the full range of what, what people understand is under the sustainability umbrella. Um, was that helpful in what way or was it, was it a hindrance in, in your ongoing adjustment to anticipating and accepting a, a breakdown of, of life as we know it? such a good question 
it's a curious thing, isn't it? I mean, as an environmentalist, I guess I was formally educated. And so with that education comes a sort of, I don't know, it's an unwritten or unspoken, an expectation that you have the answers, that you can do this, that, you know, you have all the knowledge, look up, you're standing on the shoulders of people who've gone before you and, you know, you have, you have this, you are the solution. Um, I bet I have had such a good life and I've had so many incredible experiences. Um, I suppose starting out as a young person aware that we were fragile or at least far more fragile than was being spoken about openly uh, supported me. I, I would suggest that it's more of a hindrance than a help. So personally, I've benefited from the things that I know, and they're helpful now as I change my life in another direction. But the structures, the formality, the indoctrination into a way of thinking and a way of engaging with the world uh, is largely unhelpful. I'm not being very articulate. I hope that that's kind of clear to people. Being, you mentioned the I, word I'll, indoctrination. I'll share so there's a, a Sorry, go on. You mentioned the word indoctrination. So it's a particular way of thinking about the world and about being an agent of change and being professional that we learn within the environmental sector. Is that, so it's particular to that, you mean? It, I don't know if it's particular to that. I think it's, it's present within that. Perhaps it's particular to our way of educating mm -hmm. in that we, there's a, there's a separation, isn't there? We, as an environmental science student, I was always looking at the environment, at the ecology from the outside. So there was always a, there's always a distance. We're all we're trained to to perceive and observe in that way from the outside. So we're separated. There's a separation that's built into that, and I think that's unhelpful. I think that's really mm. unhelpful. And I don't think it's unique to environmental sciences, particularly, or sustainability particularly, but it was very marked for me. And Jim, there's something else about, I can share with you a, a parallel story. So I was trained formally as a musician, as a child. So I can read music, I can play various instruments. And then at about the age of 20, I was invited to a jam session in a great big, in a blues club. And I went along and I couldn't jam for the life of me. And my friends who knew that I could play music and was fluent were astonished. But somehow the rigor of my training meant that I didn't have the freedom to let go. And so there's a parallel for me between that and being educated in the natural sciences and sustainability and being able to engage in the world in ways that that are fulfilling and that feed you and that are life affirming. It's that same, it's almost like that same sort of rigor creates a barrier between you and the thing of passion. Yes, wow. Um, there's some, I think, so I'm a, I'm a professor, meaning then I've, I've had to work super hard and spend half my life in front of a computer. And, I think it, it, it does switch off certain possibilities for knowing because you think that the only valid way of saying anything about anything is if you've read 50 papers on it and you're very clear on your methodology. And um, also it means you're really tired from staring at <laughs> papers all the time that maybe you're not... <laughs> myself and other people, perhaps not as quite widely read and reflected on, on all manner of issues as we could be. So for me, taking a sabbatical for a year, just off completely, was massive, really massive in, in my ability to rethink. I think also I was so part of and proud of being part of this, what we called third wave solutions environmentalism from the 90s, where governments weren't doing much. So, well, NGOs, ethical consumers, charismatic CEOs and ethical businesses we're gonna we're gonna sort it all out ourselves that story 
and therefore let's not talk about doom and fear and any of that let's talk about you know how do this and it'll improve your life and we can achieve all this that and the other so um so yeah for me i was uh, and so yeah environmentalism very therefore closely aligned with um entrepreneurship finance globalizing capital and all, all that stuff too and if you think it's all failing then um in my case that was yeah quite challenging and i was in the corporate sustainability field and um it's why i should be more forgiving of all those people who uh, keep criticizing <laughs> uh, <laughs> which brings me to the question of the criticism is cat you and i we've given up haven't we that's what the criticism is that's it yes Deep adaptation represents that. you giving up <laughs> me giving up so have you given up yes or no and you can challenge the question as well but that's the the thing we hear <laughs> i notice i feel quite affronted at the idea that i've given up so i'm going to have to spend a bit of time with that later on i suspect um okay no i haven't given up i mean i still i, I still run part of my working life is i still run a small not-for-profit in the uk that works around ecological restoration and reconnecting communities with their local environments and increasingly around community resilience as a result of those other efforts. Um, so I'm still committed. I'm more frustrated than I used to be by the bureaucracy and by the, I, I get, I find the process of doing good in the world really irritating. I feel like I fight continuously to just to make a tiny difference that, that, really is exhausting um but no i haven't given up and, and actually i i probably guess and i'm looking at some of the faces on the screen who know me well i'm probably contributing more towards um change now than i have at any other point in my career it just looks different i'm not tying myself to trees or waving placards in the streets i'm not petitioning parliaments or trying to persuade and coerce the heads of multinational organizations as I did during my career, it's softer and more gentle and more local and more intimate now. It just mm. looks different. Yeah. So I'll reframe the question. What are you not giving up on and won't give up on? first thing that came into my body was love and humanity and by humanity I don't, <laughs> I don't mean humanity as in the whole of the human population the best of people i'm not mm. giving up on that i'm not giving up on mm. our capacity to care to look after one another i'm not giving up on our capacity for generosity I'm not giving up on our capacity to work really bloody hard when we need to. I'm not giving up on those things, and I won't. Um, yeah, I'm going to leave it there. Generosity, the belief in the best of humanity. Um, you might have yeah, called me on a good day, I have Jim. a question for me, not anybody else now. What would you tell me that like, I, 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 I get a bit stressed and down, not just about criticisms of me or my work, but criticisms of anyone who's really taking seriously some of the worst case scenarios, talking about it publicly and changing their lives accordingly in their own ways. I get down, stressed, angry and down when I see that being ha happening and it is the typical way mass media corporate media will touch on this topic they label it doomism in a way where it's a pejorative term and also it's it's the way that um, um establishment environmentalists and climate scientists many of them will, will speak as well when when asked to speak on it and um And I think, yeah, it might occupy too much of my reality, you know, that 
disappointment, frustration, sometimes anger. So you've probably come across other people, or is it just me? <laughs> you've probably <laughs> felt it yourself or come across other people like, hey, well, how do we, how do we, um, how do we uh, love ourselves in that context? And I have come across it myself, Jim, uh, as has probably everybody on the screen. Someone very wise once said to me, what other people think of you is none of your business. Which is really helpful in terms of not taking things personally. What mm -hmm. We move through a world of mirrors. And the world reflects back to us the things we may not like so much about ourselves. Um, And oh, this is really difficult to say because it doesn't apply across the board, but for a large part, at least for us in white, in our white Western realities, we're all deeply traumatized. We're harmed and have been harmed by the very systems that proclaim to be benefiting us. And we're not good at dealing with trauma and we, we, we push it away. We, so I would suggest that if you're provoking that kind of response from people, that's great because they're feeling that discomfort and not knowing how to deal with that discomfort, they have to separate themselves from it and make you mm. responsible, make me responsible, make the people on this screen responsible. Mm. We, can, we can love it better. That's a bit naive, isn't it? A bit of a hippie statement, but appreciate that it's not all about you. It's not all about me. Sometimes it's just them and they are just a reflection of the system in which they operate. They'll, they'll learn if they're lucky. Right. I hope they do. Yes, yes. Um, you've just reminded me how I used to feel. <laughs> <laughs> Let's have a conversation about that later then. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um... Definitely, I felt that way, but I um, don't know what's happened recently. <laughs> so I just want to say to um, our guests, hello, everyone, and please send questions if you have them uh, to Stuart, uh, because I'm going to come to you in a, just a few minutes. Um, before we do that, um, um, and, and uh, actually, uh, Maria, um, Stuart, I will come to Maria first. I'm just having just seen a few questions coming in here. I'll just get that one lined up and I'll have a look at the other questions later. Kat, um, I read another opinion survey. Uh, ooh, Bath University. Uh, about half, more, if it was more than half of all young people, under, so younger than 24 or younger polled, sorry, young adults, 18 to 24, um, anticipate societal breakdown, are distressed about it, it is affecting whether they want to have kids. Um, you know, so prop, prop, properly internalizing this. Um, and yet, um, we see still very little, uh, actually, we see very little allowed to be talked about these possible or likely futures. Uh, and how what's already being experienced as you know societal breakdown in many parts of the, the world uh, you know how that's going to be spreading so we're yeah it's it's still taboo it seems and the, so the criticism and the reasons for that we've just covered and and so where are people going to turn because there are some of us who are fortunate enough to discover what is still quite a niche community and network, the deep adaptation ethos and forum. Most people, yeah, they'll, where will they turn? I'm hearing many more people talking about how their Christian communities are talking about it's the end times with something of a little bit of a fatalism and, and therefore we just pray, wait and don't change. Um, yeah, so um, I'd be interested to know, is there a role, should we be doing, could, could we, should we <laughs> be doing more <laughs> in outreach? Um, 
are we doing more? I'm doing, I'm doing a little bit more than I used to um, on that. I, I didn't want to do any outreach because um, it was heavy. It was a heavy thing to do, to bring this, you know, consciously, actively, to bring my view of the world to other people um, mm. beyond the initial viral paper. Um, so I focused on just networking the people who already heard about it and got it. Um, and then just trusted that they'll do have conversations in their own ways in their own communities and families and organizations but maybe there's yeah i'm changing well you know i've changed the past year i've thought how what can we do that's a little bit more out there so what are your thoughts on this well i think if i speak on behalf of the forum we are gently taking we're making ourselves more visible so i'm not sure i would call that outreach exactly but we now have a presence on, on multiple social media platforms that we didn't have historically. So we have an Instagram account. We've always had LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, et cetera. Um, many people here will be aware that we are looking to launch a new platform for the forum, which migrates us away from the vulnerabilities and the peculiarities of Facebook and allows a, an alternative to the original professions network, which was always a little bit clunky and counterintuitive to use. Um, there are more and more affiliated groups emerging and there are uh, moves afoot from within the forum, the core team proper and the holding group to be writing more uh, publicly, uh, talking more openly about deep adaptation. The thing that keeps coming into my mind, I have seen, gosh, I would, has, I hate to hazard a guess, literally thousands of initiatives put forward by someone who had an answer and then put a lot of energy and effort into selling that answer and persuading people it was absolutely right. And invariably, as humans, we're not very good at that, right? We push, we, we automatically, there's automatically pushback if someone is telling you what's right for you, what's good, what's proper. So something much more, something much more invitational feels <clears throat> appropriate. And that I strongly suspect that outreach within the Deep Adaptation Forum is happening all of the time, but it's happening informally. It's happening because <clears throat> Maria has a conversation with a neighbor. It's happening because Iris has discussed it with her mum last time they had a telephone call. It's happening because Lisa's talking about it with the chap who grumbles about the weather in the grocery store. I think it's happening all the time. And, and I would suggest that that kind of organic growth if for want of a better word is far more powerful it's slow and it's it's hidden because you can't point at it but my strong suspicion is it's happening all the time and as people find their strength and their resilience within the forum they'll be more and more willing to to step out they'll feel strong enough to engage in those conversations they'll feel strong enough to be inviting uh, more consideration and yes I notice some tension in my body about not quick enough but it's yeah who's to say what's quick enough mm. thank you Kat we're gonna invite the questions now so first uh, Maria please unmute and also it'd be lovely to hear whenever you and the next person who asks a question say where you are okay can you hear me yes very well yeah Okay, uh, I'm talking to you from a uh, balcony uh, near Stockholm, Sweden. It's a warm summer evening here, so that's why I'm sitting outside. Uh, during your conversation, I started to wonder how you actually define environmentalism. It sounded like uh, as if it automatically include for you the idea that if you are an environmentalist, you must be positive and feeling that things can still be changed uh, as opposed to having given up. And the way I think about it is way more, you can accept that, you know, it, it's all gonna go to hell, but you can still be an environmentalist so that's Thank my you. question 
cats, how, yeah, it's been uh, the issue for your whole life, or at least since 14, cat. What is environmentalism <laughs> in general to you right now? Or what do you I, want, I want it to become? I wanted to giggle when Maria raised that question, and I hope that Ben's having a chuckle to himself because he posed that exact question uh, on the Facebook thread. What is, how are we defining environmentalism? Um, no, I don't think that being an environmentalist means always maintaining a positive framing or a positive outlook. So I, I'm, I must be more conscious about how I communicate, Maria, because clearly that's what came across for you in that conversation. Um, I would call myself an environmentalist, but I'd have called myself an environmentalist long before I went to college and then university to study the natural sciences. Uh, and for me, that, associ that association with environmentalism was feeling a deep connection and appreciation of the natural world. So I cared enough to want to do something about it, to, to support it, to look after it, to petition on behalf of endangered species, to give a voice to things which were voiceless in our, within our system. Um, and I don't think you have to be hopeful of saving everything in order to take action. If you save one thing, that's still a positive impact. And and what what I'm doing here, so I've rearranged my we've rearranged our entire lives. Thank heavens for my husband John, who's listening in on this video recording. But we've changed our lives, and a lot of what we do here is about supporting nature, reintroducing local endemic species, helping plants to migrate, providing food for native animals. Uh, by creating an environment which had been largely um, sterilized, monocultured, as we are wont to do. So, uh, but knowing I can't save it all doesn't make me want to not do that bit. Does that answer the question? Yeah, I was just, can I, if I, I'm interested then is, is what's the environmentalism that's true for you and animates you, excites you, drives you right now then? I'm going to say that word again, relationship. Mm -hmm. So um, as a youngster, I probably did have, I was imbued in the same way as many of us with that, um, well, just notice myself set up straight, with that idea of dominion, nature is for us, it's for us to take what, you know, it feeds us, it's for, it provides us with what we need, but actually mm -hmm. there's, not a, a, there's not a reciprocal, respectful relationship with nature that's definitely shifted for me. So environmentalism for me now is about that respectful, reciprocal, accountable relationship with the natural world. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So we're gonna have another question on that topic, actually. Uh, Brigitte, um, if you unmute, over to you and ask Kat your question. Also say where you are, that'd be great to know. Sure. Hi, um, I'm in Montreal in um, Quebec, Canada. And, um, so it's great to be with you all. Thank you for doing this. My question, Kat, came from when you were discussing being in relationship with oneself, but then centering a relation, uh, yourself in a relationship with others. And that really intrigues me because um, I understand what you're saying, but I, at the same time, I completely don't understand what you're saying. So I wondered if you could say, how does one center themselves in relationship as opposed to themselves? God, you guys are asking great questions. <laughs> Bridget. Um, oh, I'm looking to Matthew on the screen because Matthew, Matthew described this to me. Um, everyone on the screen will have had an experience where you're engaging and interacting with someone, but they're not really with you. They're absent. So they're physically present in front of you but their mind is preoccupied. They might have be answering messages on their telephone. They're clearly not, they're not emotionally present with you. And that's, it, it's, um, God, it hurts. That's a lonely place to be. And I'm as guilty of it as anyone else. So I have to hold my own hand up. 
something about being committed to being in relationship with the other, which is about really being with the other, hearing them, sensing them, bringing all of your attention, not just listening with your ears, but with your whole body. So we, we have some practices that are offered routinely within Deep Adaptation Forum called deep listening and deep relating. They're two different modalities. Deep relating is about building a familiarity with yourself so that you start to understand where your triggers are and what sensations emerge in your body in response to particular triggers. Deep listening is about turning your attention to being with the other person in their reality, to avoiding that need we all have to fill the space to respond, to react, and to just being present with someone. And so that is a practice which has really helped me to transform my relationships in the last few years, and not just my relationship with myself and with other people, but the relationship with this beautiful piece of the earth that I have the privilege of stewarding. As I bring my presence to that too. Does that answer the question? Thank you. I, I think um, so, but um, I, I guess, because I, I already do what you're saying. So when, when I heard you speak at first, I thought you meant um, anchoring ourselves in relationships, but that I guess is not what you meant. Um, so I'll think about it, but, but thank you for, uh, for helping me understand. Thanks. Thank you. You. Um, Iris, uh, if you could unmute, say where you are, and uh, yes, hi. To your hi, I'm uh, I'm in not so sunny Bristol in the UK. It's quite windy, actually. <laughs> um, so, yeah, my my question is, uh, I, I, and I wrote this down earlier. It's a, it's it's basically that sometimes I feel. I, the best word I could come up with was arrogant, but some of it might actually be impatience, that I feel quite impatient with other people sometimes in the sense that I am I feel that I'm looking at a very different future, for, as we have discussed, which is the sort of deep adaptation, um, sort of understanding that we share with each other and that you share in the forum. And I find that if people haven't arrived at that, uh, at that point in a sort of natural organic way in the same way that Kat described, it's very difficult to make people arrive at it unless they are ready to. And so in terms of the environmental work that we do and the, and the sort of trying to sort of get other people to maybe see the world in a slightly different way in the way that we might be at least there's some common features that we probably see the world in even if they're quite diverse mm. still as Kat pointed out there's still some common features as in it's probably not going to go very well <laughs> might be the common I, feature I, <laughs> so the question I, sorry. no I sorry. think I've heard the question there which is that do we yourself but also yeah. others because I relate to this Iris is that do yeah. we risk becoming a bit arrogant think and and, and maybe there is yeah a, I'm just wondering you've, you've helped me think that maybe I do give up myself in terms of the the possibilities of having conversations about this mm. with with, many, with anyone mm. and I, I think I do I think I I, I, I don't I, and therefore yeah. I it can feel somewhat alienating if not, if not mm -hmm. arrogant Feeling a bit yeah. alienated. Do we risk? Do we risk just accepting that we 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 we, we are aliens? <laughs> uh, but Pat. but I but I thought actually maybe we, Sorry, my question was more so. My question was more so. Do we do we in a way just hold the the deep adaptation principles inside ourselves mm. and and don't try and communicate the the principles themselves? you know, out to people who might not be ready and just concentrate on the work with people that you know the local work the connecting with people without the principles worded without them being phrased in particular ways that might people might not be ready for so it's almost a parallel yes, process and if not the principles then the the bigger picture stuff about as you yes, were saying that's what i mean yes, that we anticipate, yes which makes us well, it doesn't and I realize it doesn't make us so strange if, if these opinion polls are correct. But mm. Kat, any thoughts on this? Yeah, it's a question which comes up often, I think, and I, I absolutely resonate as you 
Jim uh, said, I, I find myself guilty of this. Yes, me too, Iris. But I guess I've arrived at a place where I recognize not everybody has to perceive the world the way I perceive it in order to be better. So I love the four R questions that Jem originally postulated, the three in the paper and the one which came later, because you don't have to believe in societal collapse and an, in, and an ending to life as we know it in order for those questions to add value to your life. We've just, well, I'd say emerging from a pandemic. The government will have us believing that we are emerging from a pandemic um, or the narrative will have us believing. But in the context of, a pan of, of what we've all just experienced in the last two years, those questions are relevant. In the face of the death of a loved one, those questions are relevant. In the face of a change of career or a transition in education, those questions are relevant. And so inspire them, Iris. They don't have to think the way you think to be the way you are. Yes, thank you, thank you. I think I want to watch this video later. <laughs> I want to, there's, I've had a few ahas and a few, actually a few reminders of of the way of being that felt very natural and instinctive to me when I was uh, fully involved in the Deep Adaptation Forum, which will be coming up to two years ago now. Come back, Jim. Well, it is, it's, it's interesting to me. It's like this, all this stuff, it, it feels right, true, loving, kind, kind to myself. Uh, it feels calm and patient, allowing. There's a fluidity to it rather than a forcing. And, um, yeah, interesting indeed. I'm, I've really valued the question. Um, we have a question from Terry, but Terry needs to go. Um, so I'm going to put it, <laughs> she's just waving goodbye. So I will put it, but in a slightly different way, which is um, community building is extremely important to you. And Deep Adaptation Forum has been mainly online community building. Um, not entirely, of course, and many people take these ideas and implement them in their own face-to-face -face, uh, groups. What, what, from your experience as coordinator and also in the Deep Adaptation Forum from before that, um, what has been really important that you have actually then also been able to integrate outside the DA world in your other work, your other voluntary work or professional paid work? Is there a, what is it that's, is there a sort of a skills transfer? And as I say that, I think, oh, well, there's the whole guides and facilitators, and there's the facilitators group. So there's the, the guidance database, there's the facilitators group. So I guess there's quite a bit of skill sharing that's, that's going on and maybe a DA ethos and modalities that you, like a couple that you've mentioned, which are, which are appearing elsewhere. Is there anything you could say about that? Yeah, there is. Um... More than three years since I found the forum, and, and I, you've heard me say this before, Gem, as have others on this screen, I had an experience of coming home, finding my people when I joined the forum. That has been transformative for me. I was, in terms of my career, in, my, in terms of my commitment to my community, in terms of my energy, I was done, I was so tired so disheartened, just exhausted by the whole thing. Being part of the Deep Adaptation Forum, never mind now holding some responsibility for its ongoing development and, and sustenance, has been personally transformative. There isn't an aspect of my life that has not been touched by this. And in the first 12 months that I was a member of the forum, I joined my local government, I became a town councillor. I worked with others in my small community around community food growing in the shape of uh, allotments in an orchard. We started a uh, repair cafe to reduce waste going to landfill and to reconnect older members of the community with incredible skills with youngsters with broken bicycles and clocks. And so that was an incredible initiative through the pandemic. We fed 120 local aged people who were um, 
isolated and alone. And we set up a buddy system on the telephone so that people were getting regular telephone calls from other community members now. None of those things really, apart from perhaps growing food, has anything to do with societal collapse. But they all have an incredible benefit in terms of building community. So it, it, we don't have to be wedded to the end is nigh, chicken little, the sky is falling, all of that storytelling. We can contribute to building community without having to have the whole community agree with where we are through tapping into existing initiatives. And my resilience, my enthusiasm, my strength to do those things is only enhanced through being part of this community where I can turn up almost every day and go, oh, and I can be heard and I can be held and I can be my, I can be thoroughly myself. And I don't, and don't, I, I don't underestimate the power of that. This is not about Deep Adaptation Forum as an entity changing the world. This is about Deep Adaptation Forum supporting the people who individually are transforming their worlds. Yeah, thank you, Kat. Um... What an awful doomist inactivist you sound like, eh? Yes. Rubbish, isn't it? <laughs> Get out there on the barricades and... Okay. <laughs> All right, thank you for um, sharing an hour. I'm, um, I'm really looking forward to not only watching this again, but sharing this video uh, online on my YouTube channel and Odyssey channel and then people please, um, you'll get an email with a link to it, those of you who are on this call, and then please do share it. Uh, maybe use this as a very gentle way of um, talking about these issues with people who you feel are ready, or just put it out there and see if anyone wants to talk to you to know more. Thanks, Stuart, as well, for doing the, the tech. Cheers, Kat. Bye-bye, everyone. See you next time. Thank you so much, everybody. See you soon.